I uh, just want to welcome everybody to uh, Venture Cafe St. Louis, and uh, we're really excited to have the Yield Lab team with us today and, uh, and one of their portfolio companies that will be sharing uh, their experience. Um, it's a Brazilian company, and I'll let uh, Kieran uh, from the Yield Lab explain that a little bit more and introduce our guest. Um, but I wanted to at least just thank everybody for joining us. And this is the first of the Yield Lab um, series, which invites top ag tech entrepreneurs and scientists to share lessons learned um, that you can take, uh, you know, uh, to help grow your innovative ideas and take them globally uh, as well. And uh, this series happens on the third Thursday of each month. And uh, today we have with us uh, Kieran um, Gartland, and he is going to uh, introduce our guest and also uh, share a little bit about uh, the Yield Lab. And so I'll turn it over to you and uh, take it away. Okay, thanks very much, Tyler. So uh, as Tyler mentioned, I, I'm a part of the Yield Lab team in Latin America. Um, I'm actually uh, Irish, but I've been living here for, for over 20 years. Um, I, I grew up on a small dairy farm in Ireland, but didn't from an early age knew I wasn't going to be a farmer. So I, I ended up uh, going to college, graduating in, in economics. But uh, when I graduated, it was early 90s. There was no real uh, financial uh, services industry in, Britain, in Ireland at the time. So I ended up traveling, ended up in Brazil uh, by, by accident, really, and uh, liked it so much that I, that I ended up staying. So um, I currently work for, for the Yield Lab. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Yield Lab is a, an early stage venture capital fund that focuses on uh, agri food tech. Um, we've invested in uh, in Latin America, over 12 startups, and uh, globally, we have funds in the US, Europe, Asia, and uh, uh, Latin America. We've invested in over 50 startups. Um, so uh, Bernardo, uh, uh, my guest, he was our first um, investment in Brazil. Uh, I'll let him talk a little bit more about Terra Magna, but first, uh, maybe he can, he can sort of give a little bit of his background and, and how he ended up uh, running a very successful ag fintech startup in Brazil. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you, Tyler. It's great to be here. Uh, our, my background is not the one you might expect for a ag fintech company. I'm not into ag and I am not into finance before I started Terra Magna. I was a military engineering a engineer in the Brazilian Air Force. I'm an ele electronics engineer with emphasis on communications and radar. I ended up uh, starting Terra Magna together with my co-founders because uh, Air Force was not so great and also because we saw a huge opportunity in the Brazilian egg market because of the information asymmetry that there is in the field. So you have a lot of people, not only the farmer, depending on that very same spot of land. And most of those guys do not have the slightest clue about what is going on uh, with that land. And there is a very bad consequence for farmers, uh, given that, which is they do not have access to credit. You do not give credit to people you do not trust or people you do not know. And this hurts uh, Brazilian farmers a lot. So, Kieran invested in us, the youth lab invested in us by late 2019. And since then they've increased their stake in our last uh, venture round. So yeah. great to have them as partners. Yeah, and, and we're very happy. So, I mean, maybe uh, what I'll do is give a little bit of, a, of an overview of what, what's happening in the ag tech um, ecosystem in the region. I mean, there's been a couple of different uh, phases or, or waves. Uh, a couple of years ago, we saw an explosion of early stage startups uh, focused mainly on farms. So with precision ag and farm management systems, uh, they had a couple of challenges, I guess, from the beginning. One was uh, the lack of connectivity on the farm, uh, which sort of uh, was, was a big obstacle. Uh, the second was maybe um, that the technology wasn't that good. Uh, and, and, and thirdly was it was a very difficult scalable business model. So B, B2C direct to farmers, farmers are, are traditionally, and, and we'll come back to this in a minute, uh, 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 they lack working capital. It's very seasonal when they have money. It's uh, very, very uh, sort of narrow windows of when you can sell to farmers. And part of, part of that uh, struggle for, for startups was trying to convince them that they, 
they needed these uh, digital solutions that would improve their performance. So, so I think that was a, bit, a big challenge at the beginning. The second phase, I guess, was when we saw over the last two years uh, uh, growth in the number of tech hubs and, and innovation hubs across uh, Brazil. And, and the results of this was to bring farmers and corporates closer to the, the startup community um, by, by accelerating them, by uh, investing directly in early stage startups, angel groups. Um, but also, I guess, it changed the model slightly from a, a B2C to a B2B to C. So we had uh, easier direct channels to farmers rather than trying to sell to farmers directly. Um, we, had, we had large corporate corporations that were the actual customers for the technology and they ended up pushing it out to farmers. And, and I think that's one of the things we, we liked about Teha Magnet wasn't uh, direct to farmer. So maybe, maybe Bernardo, if you'd explain a little bit about your business model and, and what exactly Teha Magnet does uh, and, and what sort of problems you're solving and, and what sort of uh, solutions you're offering. Great. So one very important thing to put forward is that Brazilian agriculture has a lot of peculiarities. And one of them is that farmers do not have a, a credit. They do not have, uh, they are very bad at generating equity for themselves. So they do not uh, generate money. Uh, they are unable to stash money, so to speak. And the other very interesting thing is that the credits that they do get is credit not given by banks or by financial institutions, but actually provided by retailers, industries, and tradings. So farmers are not actually going to the bank, getting uh, money and buying the, their inputs. They are actually buying their inputs in the start of the season and paying for them at the end of the season. So if you start to think about that, that's kind of like a loan, a short-term loan from six months to 12 months. And that's very bad for the farmer because he's unable to actually see the amount of interest that he's paying in his inputs. What Terra Magna does is to help those retailers properly finance farmers with fair interest rates. Uh, we price the in the risk of each operation separately. And we are not using uh, one ruler to all the farmers. We are actually pricing risk appropriately and reducing interest rates dynamically for each of them and then providing the inputs. So that's Terra today. We are able to do that uh, mostly because the underwriting method, underwriting and collection methods that we use are based on the farmer business and not on some financial data that is floating somewhere. We look at the land of the farmer, we look at the farmer's yield, we look at uh, how much he produces at, at what cost, and we better understand what is the collateral that he or she is providing. With that, we have a very clear picture of the risk that is offered and we price accordingly. Uh, one interesting thing that uh, Kieran mentioned, and which is the biggest challenge that um, every Egg tech company faces here in Brazil is the go-to-market strategy. You shouldn't be targeting farmers directly or you should be very conscious when doing that because farmers are very technologically averse and you have to have a trust proxy to work with them. That's why we are one of those companies that uh, Kieran mentioned, which are B2B2C. If we try to provide credit directly to the farmer, uh, our cock would explode because addressing farmers directly is very expensive. And additionally, uh, we wouldn't be able to get scale because we would have to target each farmer ind individually. By getting one retailer, we are targeting hundreds of farmers. Yeah, and that, and that sort of leads me into the third phase of, of ag tech, which, which started last year, which was uh, the arrival of COVID. So I guess an analogy here is if, if you, if you think of all the previous work done by startups, it's like planting the seed and then COVID came along and it was like this huge tropical storm that everybody was afraid would, would just blow everything away. But in the end, it ended up being very, very uh, actually beneficial for, for the ag tech uh, business model in general, because it sort of leveled the playing field uh, in relation to competing with more traditional companies for, for those startups that didn't have a big uh, sales team uh, most of the engagement was all uh, become virtual. So I think 
that sort of uh, helped helped in a lot of ways. It also helped um, maybe uh, show that disruption is real for, for a lot of these skeptics or, or uh, farmers or maybe some of the big corporates who, who felt that uh, you could only really do farming or, or, or relate to farmers in a certain way in person, uh, going out and visiting the farm. So, so we've seen uh, that that some of those concepts have been disrupted, um, and, and, and startups are having more uh, ability to scale quicker virtually, even to to farmers. But uh, it's still a big challenge. So I think one one of the biggest challenges. But uh, in in your startup uh, experience. Um, and, and I know you're not from the agriculture background. Maybe could you tell us a little bit about what, what sort of surprises that you had on the way or, or what things that you, uh, what, what perceived ideas that you have that maybe uh, were, were, were much different in, in, in reality to uh, what you discovered? First of all, we expected to be able not to deliver initially the credit properly, but to deliver the actual system which would enable retailers to provide credit for farmers. So they would only have to use a system. Uh, by using the system, they would have a much clearer uh, risk profile of the farmer and be able to get funding uh, for that farmer through a bank, for instance. And we had two, two surprises. Uh, the first one was retailers were not interested in using yet another system. And banks also didn't want to use the risk that we were, uh, to buy the risk we were providing them. And that was a rude awakening in the sense that in agriculture, uh, you, you have a very long road if you are trying to provide a service or a product, but if you provide the direct bottom line for them, so you are providing a system which will enable them to get credit. So instead of doing that, just provide credit, for instance, or insurance or inputs. So that agriculture has this very, despite being a long-term game, game, it has this very short-term uh, site, which uh, demands that you are actually providing the already end product. Uh, another thing which we learned is that agriculture is much, much uh, more intolerant to uh, mistakes than any other kind of market. Because when you are, and I think that this relates pretty well with the first phase that you mentioned, Kieran, because AgTex here in Brazil uh, tried the move fast and break things approach to farmers. And when you move fast and break things in agro, you are not... Um, freezing an app in his cell phone. You are actually uh, threatening his livelihood, uh, the farmer's livelihood. And they are very intolerant, intolerant to that. So you are not able to make so many mistakes. And what we learned with that is to be very conscious before shipping anything because uh, the amount of loss that can uh, come from a mistake when you are playing with that is much, much uh, bigger than in other markets. Yeah, for sure. Maybe um, it might be worth for our audience to give, I mean, there's a lot of sim similarities in farming around the world, but I, I, I figured there is also a lot of differences here in, in, in South America, specifically in Brazil, in a tropical country. And one of the things I'd like to point out is that mm -hmm. uh, I think it was back in the 90s, we, we had an influx of uh, a lot of U.S., young farmers coming, second generation farmers coming down to Brazil and being very attracted by the price of land that at, at the time was around $100 an acre. So uh, they thought this is, this is like paradise, farmer's paradise, where you can uh, grow all year round, uh, 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 very good weather conditions uh, and, and $100 an acre land. But their big surprise was that when they when they bought the land, then they, they realized that the land wasn't very fertile. So it's 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 basically uh, a support mechanism for the plant. It doesn't have any natural nu nutrients. So it, it actually costs maybe $2,000 an acre to actually make uh, to produce anything. So uh, then they discovered there's actually no uh, credit lines and not just because they don't have a credit history, but because there is no credit line for, for anybody. So uh, then they discover it's, uh, well, logistics, when they need to order their seed or their fertilizer, they have to do it uh, six months in, in, in advance because they you're in the middle of nowhere and, and, and the logistics involved is very difficult. Uh, so then 
you have to pay up front in cash six months ahead of time. Uh, uh, so it, it becomes a huge burden. Um, and, and, and maybe th there's, there's like some survive. So that was a natural filtering process where only the, the fittest survived. I think uh, there are still some, some uh, farmers in, in the Northeast of Brazil still farming uh, 20 years later, but a lot of them disappeared. So uh, looking at that, I mean, do you see in terms of a natural barrier uh, to entry for, for you from maybe outside technology coming into Brazil uh, with maybe a lot more capital to compete with you? How, how do you see uh, Brazil in terms of, of uh, opportunity and challenge for, for startups coming from abroad? Yeah. I'd have to second that answer. You, the history that you told is amazing because uh, we have this issue with Brazil, which is we are a tropical country and agriculture, uh, uh, tropical agriculture is something very, very recent in the world, uh, in the model that is done in Brazil. So Mato Grosso, which is the biggest soybean and corn producer, it was only recently um, planted uh, since the 70s. And that was only because the technologies which were being developed in uh, I believe it was Mississippi, the Mississippi University, didn't apply, uh, apply directly, but were adapted to Brazil. And we have a word for that in Portuguese, which is, uh, would be translated as tropicalization. So you have to take a technology and adapt to our conditions. So for instance, we have a lot of uh, uh, pest uh, pressure here in Brazil, which is not something that you see so much in North America. The amount of pesticides that, that we do apply in our crops are not due to an actual excess, but uh, because of a need, which is if you don't apply that amount of pesticides, you will get pests and you will lose your crops. So if you take some technology from North America or Europe and try to directly apply to our agriculture, maybe in the south southern part of Brazil, you have a bigger success because of the profile of the farmer, which is a much smaller farmer, similarly to what we have in the US. Uh, but the, if you go try to go to the actual big market, which it would be Mato Grosso and Mato Piba, and by, you wouldn't be able to do so. You would have to adapt, you'd have to understand uh, where you're placing you know, the, the battleground. And there is another aspect of the battleground, which is our bureaucracy. It is very difficult to make a business in Brazil because everything has, has to go through notary houses and you have to get permissions. And this presents itself as an opportunity for whoever is able to solve that kind of stuff. But currently it's just a pain. And from some, for someone who is coming from US or Europe, it will be a very bad surprise. It's very difficult. And I'd like to hear uh, about you, Kieran, uh, regarding our portfolio companies coming into Brazil. Uh, it is very, very difficult to come from outside and start playing in Brazil without a native. Well, the, it's funny you mention that because one, one of the, we, we started in Argentina and our first investments, uh, first five investments were actually Argent, Argentine startups. And it really surprised me that rather than come to Brazil as the natural progression uh, when expanding, that they, a lot, a lot of them skipped Brazil and went straight to the U.S. Uh, so, so despite, I mean, the fact that Spanish and Portuguese are, are pretty similar language-wise, uh, they were they were afraid of Brazil uh, as being some sort of wild uh, west, and in terms of uh, legislation, rules, uh, trust issues, maybe all sorts of uh, things that that maybe exist, but uh, I don't think it's nearly as bad as as what they imagined. Um, and, and, and uh, definitely there are, there are challenges, uh, but looking at it from, from the other point of view, what about, what about, I mean, for you to take your technology or your solution and apply it uh, to, to other countries or farmers in other countries, do you see that there's a, a natural path towards that, that sort of uh, uh, taking your technology and expanding or scaling it abroad, or, or is that something Brazil is big enough for the moment? It will be a challenge, Kieran, but I believe that the biggest challenge will not be 
uh, the tropical the adaptation of technology, but rather the legislation which we face in the other country. So, for instance, we rely a lot in uh, the CPR, the Cédula de Produto Rural, which is a Brazilian title which was create, created in order to allow input uh, input uh, agrochemical companies, input resellers, and input, um, chemical companies to actually sell their inputs and receive uh, in crop production. So we rely on that a lot. There is a similar structure in Argentina, so that would be a, and there is a, there is a certain lack of credit in Argentina as well. So it would be a natural progression. Latum as a whole is very similar in that sense, except for uh, Chile and Africa would be the next frontier. Uh, I'd like just to answer Dan, uh, who sent um, a question in the chat uh, regarding the price risk management for land farms. Uh, the most limiting aspect then is the understanding of how and use them. So we do have tradings right now operating in Brazil and they are able to provide forward contracts, but farmers do not have the slightest idea of when they should be actually doing the forward contract. And the consequence of that is that, for instance, here in Brazil, we have, uh, due to soybeans in, in dollars, uh, did raise, but uh, the exchange rate uh, does help here in Brazil. And since uh, the exchange rate helped even more, a lot of farmers uh, left um, half of their potential revenue in the table only because they were unable to po properly assess when to use those pricing tools. So Kieran has a lot of experience in the exchange rate. They might, he might have a different approach. Yeah, I, I mean, those big challenges. I, I worked with the, the, for the CME group here for 10 years in, in, in Brazil. Uh, the biggest challenge for, for us was uh, the lack of capital. Again, we're coming back to that lack, lack of uh, working capital the farmer has to actually uh, use the futures market or options market uh, in, in terms of um, being able to, to uh, pay margin margin calls and all of that. So, uh, and apart from that, just the, 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 the difficulty in movement of capital uh, between between countries. So uh, exchange rate risks. So it, I mean, it, it boils down to farming is similar everywhere, but I think in Brazil, it's, it's, it's extra uh, risky because of the, the, that pest and disease pressure of, of trying to produce in tropical countries, the exchange rate, which you can be actually stung on twice when you're buying your inputs, which are mostly imported, uh, and, and, and when you're selling your produce, which is mostly uh, based off the dollar price in, in Chicago. So, so I think there's a, a little appetite from farmers for taking on more risk in terms of trying out new technologies. Uh, and I think that's one of the difficulties in, in convincing them to, to spend money or invest in, 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 in technology. Uh, and I think that's why maybe outside the farm gate is where, where systemic solutions rather than selling to farmers is, is probably uh, a lot more um, doable at the moment. And it's where we're seeing the most traction uh, in terms of logistics, uh, where, where Brazil has a lot of problems, a lot of pain points, a lot of issues. And, and maybe that goes back to uh, the rapid growth in, in Brazil's production. I mean, when I arrived in, in 1994, Brazil was producing 25 million uh, metric tons of soybeans. Now, last year, they produced 133 million metric tons. So that's like 500% growth. Um, the infrastructure is mostly the same. So it's still mostly 70% being transported by truck to the ports. Uh, the ports have improved a little bit. Storage, on-farm storage is still mostly non-existent. Um, so farmers usually sell at harvest time. They, yes. uh, uh, they don't have the luxury of, of being able to hold on to it to to get the best price. Um, so, so I think all of those issues can be solved by technology. So, I mean, the ELAB, in Latin America, we've invested in a, in a marketplace, a digital marketplace. We've invested in uh, logis intelligence logistics uh, solution, um, credit, uh, insurance. So, so it's sort of like um, uh, we're looking, not that we're not looking inside farm gate, but we, we think that the, the biggest moves will be made outside the farm gate. And then eventually uh, technologies will, will push inside the farm gate, but not from a pull factor of the farmers wanting it, but actually from the market uh, pushing it in there because uh, of other factors like, like um, 
sustainability, they want visibility, uh, the final consumers want, want to know uh, where their food's coming from, how it's made. Uh, Brazil does have an issue with, with uh, image, image on, on, on uh, deforestation and, and, and sustainability. Uh, so I think technology eventually will, will be pushed inside FarmGate if farmers want to be part of the, the supply chain. Um, and, and I think that's, that's going to be very positive. Eventually, they will, they will benefit uh, enormously from that because at the moment, it's, it's very, as you say, hand to mouth. Uh, farmers don't really have a cash reserve. Uh, they're, they're producing more and more, but not really making a lot more of, uh, money. Um, so, so a lot of a lot of the margins are, are, are left along the supply chain and not actually making its way back to the farmer. Um, I don't know for for opening it up to questions. Uh, do, we should just continue. Um, so, in terms of uh, Lucky not just from, from an ag tech point of view, but from a startup, from an early stage startup, uh, how would you say what, what has been your biggest challenges uh, so far in terms of maybe uh, building the team, uh, raising capital? Uh, wh where would you say it has been your, your, your biggest uh, difficulties so far? Building the team would be number one, raising capital would be number two. Uh, we, regarding team, it is, very difficult uh, to get uh, talent in Brazil. We do have one of those talents aboard, written in the crowd, here in the crowd. But uh, additionally, I'd add that uh, it's very difficult not only to find talent, but uh, we try not to stay with our heads too much in that because Ed has worked uh, here in Brazil in a certain way. And we are trying directly to change that. And we hear a lot of no's and that won't work. And by bringing uh, fresh blood aboard, uh, that happens, that helps you have, the, it helps to have the outside view. So instead of bringing someone who will say, hey, we've always done this, uh, this like this, uh, someone who says, hey, is that serious? Do farmers actually do not get money from banks? That's absurd. So that's the kind of people we are trying to get right now. And access to capital as well, for two things, both the equity capital and the debt capital are not trivial to get in Brazil. Uh, we've lived up until now with very high uh, interest rates in Brazil. So we are talking about a 14% risk-free rate. It's amazing. Uh, in the, this was uh, three, four years ago, correct me, please, Kieran. And the consequence of that is we had very few uh, venture, uh, venture capitalists, and this is changing. Uh, we have much, much more, um, much more capital uh, available in the market right now, but we do not still have uh, a lot of funds. So we have very big funds, which raise a lot of capital, but we do not have like we do not have a hundred venture capital firms to talk to. We have literally uh, at our stage uh, seven to ten, and after that we have to go outside and raise money from the. Uh, we have uh, to raise money, for instance, from Yield Lab, which is not a Brazilian-based uh, venture capital, and that's not amazing because it hinders uh, growth and deals are made much, much smaller than in the US, which is kind of okay because uh, we do not see a lot of US companies trying to enter Brazil. Uh, we saw uh, some Israeli companies trying to get into Brazil, into a prison neck and failing mostly because of the difference in the both the technical aspects of agriculture and the market, market itself. And on the debt side, which uh, we raise uh, that uh, through that facility in order to be able to forward pay uh, those inputs to retailers. Uh, that that's also challenging because you have to go after family offices and high yield funds and say, "Hey, I'm a startup. I'm able to underwrite and collect better than everybody in this country, and that's why I want your money." It's not trivial for them to accept that. Yeah, no, and, and I agree. I think maybe. 
there's there's two sides to that lack of access of, of VCs uh, investors here. I think it on one side it, it it's it's positive in in terms of uh, bad ideas will will fail fast. I mean, there's it's harder to get money. Also, I think startups are are a lot leaner. They don't tend to uh, uh, go to market or, or uh, go to market too soon, which which happens maybe in other regions where there is easy access to VC money and then there's pressure to spend it. So. Uh, VC or startups tend to go to market or scale too quickly before they have that that good product market fit. Um, maybe around that, maybe uh, uh, from your point of view, I know you you, you had to slightly pivot from from the early days. Uh, maybe you could go through that a little bit. I mean, finding that product market fit, which I find a lot of a lot of startups don't actually get right. Um, even even after raising money, they still seem to struggle a little bit with finding that product market fit. Uh, they have a product, but they don't have a market that that wants that product or pay for it. So, I mean, how do, what, what was your experience in, in, in growing the company in finding that product market fit? And, and was it what you uh, originally expected it would be? It, it was a painful process in the sense that you made the system, you proved the underwriting, the underwriting and the collection use of the system and then you go to the retailer uh, and it's very important to mention that retailers uh, have a net margin of two percent uh, a very good retailer has a net margin of five percent so he is a he's not your standard wealthy guy and everything that he sees is just another cost for him and we saw the use we were able to prove to him that the system was useful, the underwriting collection system, and we were unable to get a lot of traction. We we start we we were able to target only the um, up market, but when we went to the uh, down market to medium and small retailers, we were unable to access them because they said, "Hey, uh, this is like um, ten percent of my of my uh, profit." I won't buy that. And the understanding of the understanding of what was the actual market need uh, was of paramount importance. So we did notice that given the system uh, was good, we were able to prove that to investors and to raise the debt facility and deploy that money to the very retailers which were unable to uh, and unwilling to pay for that. And the main message here is it's much, much better to be a old economy company technology, technologically enabled than to actually provide a system for someone to go there and do the disruption. That's pretty much what we learned. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think we have another question there. Um... Are sustainable production practices becoming a buzzword for value in, in Brazil as it is here in the US? Um, that's spiky. Uh, yes, it is, and farmers hate it. Um, why is that? Uh, because it's being forced to them uh, top down and they are not getting any return or clarity uh, around the process. And we are seeing a very good movement in the market, particularly with er European money coming into Brazil, which is that kind of sustainability um, uh, procedure is actually being priced into the credit. And that's the best way you have to get a farmer interested in being so uh, socially and environmentally compliant. You say, hey, if you do this, I'm cutting uh, 50 bips uh, out of your interest rate. Then you are actually sub uh, subsidizing uh, that uh, sustainability process, which would be an additional cost to our farmers and would reduce their competitiveness in the international markets. Not sure about what you think, Jorge. No, I agree 100%. And I think a lot, a lot of the issues about um, deforestation in Brazil, it's mostly uh, the Amazon is mostly on public land. There's no financial incentive not to cut it down. So I think that's uh, creating uh, basically a lot of bad actors coming in, and there's no there's no real uh, uh, way of, of a sort of monitoring that in, in in real time. I mean, there is now a technology, but maybe not physically with, with uh, people on on the ground. But I think 
yeah, exactly. Give give financial benefits uh, to people uh, locally to protect the forest, and and, and it, it'll happen. So it's all about uh, having the right incentives in place. Um, another another big, uh, I think, growing area in in, in Brazil and, and and elsewhere is probably the car carbon credits. Uh, uh, technology that, that can sort of monitor and, and, and uh, check those practices that are good practices that are increasing ca carbon capture uh, in the soil. Uh, I think that's sort of a market that, that we will see growing very quickly and there's very clear financial incentives uh, for, for following those uh, uh, good practices. So I think that's, that's one area that, that's real and I think it has to be backed with, with financial incentives. Uh, and if it's not done right, then it won't work. And, and, and uh, that's what we're seeing. So it's not just about having good intentions. You need to back it up with, with real uh, financial incentives. Um, so, I mean, and, and I know you originally, uh, I think very early on, you had uh, part, part of your thesis was, was uh, monitoring forests, right? Forest fires, or, or I can't remember if, if that was originally. <laughs> yes, it was uh, like in the early, early stages, was um, a working with a farmer, with a with a, a forest producers in order to identify pests and identify uh, wheat competition, and then we saw the importance of the go to market strategy. We saw that it, it was not very great to sell them directly to farmers, because it's very very challenging to access, particularly the medium and small farmers. Uh, you are going to be able to sell to the big ones, but when you try to go down markets, it's pretty challenging. You, they won't even have internet access in their houses. So that's how challenging it is. Yeah. Um, so we have another question. Is this also an eco impact story that can attract impact investors? Um, maybe broadening the investor uh, 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 scope in in uh, from ag tech to impact. Uh, do you, are you seeing any any of that at all? I'd say certainly because uh, one of the things that we will eventually uh, make in Terramanga will be a that facility uh, to finance farmers which are so socially environmentally compliant, not even to the extent of the law, but even uh, even uh, farther. But, but the idea here is what you mentioned, you have to place the right financial incentives and then you do have an impact thesis. Uh, we've seen the first green bumps in the Brazilian market uh, last year. So we had the Amagi green bumps, uh, which were actually priced lower because of the sustainability aspect that they had. And the it was another structure which was also priced lower because of that. But this is not something that we are actually seeing uh, for the small and the, actually the small farmer in Brazil, the medium as well. But the main driver for Amazon deforestation are those very small guys who do not know what is uh, ESG. And the, better, the best way to make them, the, them learn what ESG is, is that clause in their loan, which enables them to get cheaper credit. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and many of the big lenders, especially uh, people like Rabobank, and, and uh, they, they're actually doing what, what, what you mentioned. It's not even, they're going beyond what the law uh, requires, but uh, they're, not, they're not financing any farmers that have uh, cut down any trees legally or illegally in, in the past 10 years. So uh, I think that's sort of, the market is pre there's a market pressure already there, uh, but also if you if you give the right incentives, I think that also uh, will increase because a, a lot of these farmers are subsistence farmers. They don't even rely on, they don't they don't have bank accounts or, or they're they're basically it's subsistence farming. So um, and and that's how it starts. Um, maybe maybe to to I think we're coming to the last uh, five minutes. Um, Maybe if you would like to um, give your opinion on, on, on where you see uh, Brazil, Brazil's farming going in the next maybe four to five years, uh, what, what you see as sort of the, 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 the major trends or 
the major sort of disruptive uh, forces that, that can really change things over, over the next couple of years? We are seeing a very big consolidation in the impact market. And we have uh, many driving forces there. We have crops, uh, we have uh, private retailing companies, which are actually uh, backed by private equities. We have the direct sales here in Brazil. So uh, our farm structure enables uh, Syngenta and Bas and Bear to actually sell inputs directly to farmers, particularly for the big farmers of the Midwest. And those big forces are struggling to see who will get the market. And it will be a defining, uh, defining aspect of agriculture, which will be resolved in the, in the next five years for certain. Uh, we are seeing some attempts at digitalization. Uh, I, uh, thank you, Tommy. I will go through that. Uh, <laughs> We and we have seen some attempts in digitalization. Um, not, it's not very clear if the farmers are ready to be addressed in such a way, particularly to buy uh, what enables their livelihood. For instance, if they did not get the seeds by the time rains arrive, they are basically going to have a very bad season, and they. They are, do not seem to be ready to rely on a digital, uh, a digital channel to do that. Another driving force is the lack, uh, the lack or the end of subsidies in Brazilian agriculture. Uh, we have one of the most under-subsidized agriculture in the planet. And it, those subsidies which enabled uh, Brazilian agriculture to become what it, what it is today are drying up. So, that happened first with OPEX, with the input market. It is now happening with the CAPEX market as well for irrigation and machinery. And that will be challenging to farmers as well. And the third point that I would like to talk about is about the possible, uh, we have the very smart people talking about another commodities uh, super cycle, just as we had in post 2008. And if that does happen, this will be good, not only for Brazilian agriculture, but for agriculture in the whole world as well. And Tommy, who is also an investor from the Youth Lab, uh, as regarding the geospatial com community that we have in San Jose Campus. Um, Terra Magna was founded in San Jose Campus, which is a city very, very close to Sao Paulo. And the interesting part of that is that we have uh, the Brazilian NASA here in San Jose dos Campos, and we have a very, very solid geospatial community. It's worth mentioning that a lot of our underwriting and collection is based on geospatial data, not only, but uh, it's the main driving force. So that's what's behind it. Perfect, yeah, and, and I mean, I think one of the exciting things for us over the coming years is that we feel that uh, Latin America is sort of a perfect sandbox for, for ag tech startups and, and developing new technologies, uh, mainly because uh, uh, agriculture is such a, a big part of the economy here. It's, it's a growing sector, just large scale farming. Uh, we have a young demographic, a young, young farmer base uh, that, are, that are very tech friendly, um, all, all year round growing. A big variety of production, and and most importantly, a lot of uh, inefficiencies and a lot of problems to solve. So, a lot of opportunity for for startups, um, and and I think it's getting easier. It's probably never been easier to be a startup founder in Brazil. Certainly, probably everywhere else with with the number of uh, innovation hubs and and uh, support systems that exist, uh, mentors, angel investors, accelerators, and available capital. Available capital now, I mean, uh, that, that was always an issue, but I don't think that's the main, especially early stage startups, I don't think capital is their main uh, challenge. I, I think it's more about getting that, uh, uh, connecting with, with the customer and finding out what, what the real pain points are, getting to know the customer better and, and finding that product market fit. Uh, and I think if they have that, they'll, they'll find financing if, if, the, if the business model makes sense. Um, and, and, and we're seeing now more 
uh, uh, I guess, experienced teams before. The, the, we, we saw very technical uh, teams that are very product focused, but not they didn't have a strong business background, maybe, or, or not very complementary, or, or the team was very, very lopsided and, and focused on one thing. Um, and now we're seeing more rounded, uh, experienced uh, uh, entrepreneurs that have failed and learn from that, and now they're, they're becoming serial entrepreneurs. So I think that's very good. And, and also people coming from uh, other techs like FinTech, uh, looking at the opportunity in ag tech, I think is also very positive because it brings more experience and a different uh, vision and mindset into the sector that has been uh, basically suffering from that lack of, of, of new ideas and innovation and the resistance or iner inertia to change, uh, which I think is, uh, being a, a big uh, sort of challenge or roadblock for, for any progress for ag, ag techs. Um, so I, I think um, we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, I think, I think we can wrap it up. So I don't know if Tyler's gonna come back in. Um, so basically, yeah. So th thanks very much, Bernardo. Um, doesn't look like we have any more questions. Any more questions? Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here tonight um, on the first uh, Yield Lab sponsored um, live event. So looking forward to more in the future. And uh, I guess we we can leave our, our contact details in the chat if if you want, so if people have questions and, and can follow up later. Please do send any questions. And Brazil is still the land of opportunity. <laughs> do, do, yeah. do try to come here. It would uh, it would be it would be great. We need we need more entrepreneurs as well. I did share. I did share. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good Thank night. You. Bye bye.